Thank you, Commissioner Cannon. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Barber to do a roll call, please. Jim Bledsoe. Here. Harold Cannon. Here. Dale Cox. Here. Jeff Griggs. Here. Jeff McMillan. Here. Tom Rice. Here. Jim Ripley. Here. Julie Schuster. Here. Clayton Stout. Here. James Stroud. Here. Trey Teague. Here. Jamie Woodson. We have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Barbara. Uh, we have two sets of minutes to uh, approve today. Um, has everyone had a chance to look over the May uh, minutes that were provided in your packet? Do we have a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve. Second? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Schuster seconded first. So all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. Now we also need to approve the uh, conference call that we had, um, the, I guess, the first week of June. And... Um, have you, everyone had a chance to look at those? Is there any questions on those? Do I have a motion to approve those? Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, the motions are to approve both sets of minutes. Thank you. Um, I, as I scan the crowd, I see maybe one guest, but I'll go ahead and, 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 and hope that there's if there is any other guests that come in, then we'll ask them to do the sign-in sheet. And then also, um, if, if any of our guests do want to speak, just we'll do so at the time. It would be pertinent to the information we're discussing at the time. So we appreciate everybody that comes. And um, before we get started, I wanted to reflect a little bit on yesterday's committee meeting. It was a, a long meeting concerning our, um, our, our Sandhill Cranes, and I do want to reflect on it a little bit and uh, uh, before we get started with our um, uh, uh, agenda. Um, in my opinion, uh, the survey that uh, was discussed yesterday demonstrated to me that uh, we need to educate not only ourselves, the commission, but we need to educate the public and uh, we need to communicate better. Uh, I felt like that, that <coughs> that the Sandhill Cranes are an entity that um, we've, uh, we've maybe not done the best job in the world of spreading the word. When, when I read the survey and I see that 35% of even bird watchers don't know what Sandhill Cranes are, it's, it's uh, not surprising to me that we had a, a large number of hunters that uh, didn't say they approved of the season because I really don't think that when they were asked on a phone survey they knew what they were even uh, discussing. So. Um, you know, we do need to educate and, and communicate more with that. Uh, we've partnered with the TOS um, uh, for a Sandhill Crane Festival at Kawasi Refuge for 22 years. And it's not something that's just started the last few years. Uh, the festival's grown tremendously in popularity and, and, and in attendance. And I think the birds are one thing that has uh, 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 benefited the most from it because we've enlarged the Kawasi Refuge. We pu purchased 68 acres. Um, I think last year, wasn't it, that was in a critical piece of property. Uh, I think we paid, I believe, $400,000 for it, right? And the TOS even donated 20000 to help in the purchase of that. If, if I make comments today and I'm wrong, please correct me. But I, that's, that's what I've been told. Um, the, the population of the cranes are now estimated in the eastern flyway, I understand, at 85000 And that's probably even a conservative number. And so... Um, so the cranes would definitely benefit by having the, the, the refuge to have a place to stop and eat and, and, and get strong so they can continue on to Florida. So I feel like that, uh, that, that in our partnership with the TOS that, that we've benefited the birds tremendously. But so now we're at a situation where our refuges to the expense of this past year was $212,000 for the Hawassi Refuge of which 47,000 uh, was for the Crane Festival alone. Um, we did get a donation of, of around $4,500 to help with the, the purchase of seed, but when you look at the figures that we've spent, we spent um, over $600,000 in the last two years just on the Wasi Refuge, and these are licensed dollars. So when the federal um, fish and game lets us know that, that the population is now healthy enough that we can have a a, a small season, a controlled season of 2,300 birds, uh, it's hard for us to, as commissioners for the hunting public, to turn that down. Uh, I think that uh, um, we, we, 
we need to we need to continue our partner with the TOS. We need to continue to um, provide ample opportunities for wildlife watching, and, and that's not going to change. But we need to also be able to work with them to develop a, a partnership that in, also involves hunting. And, you know, we were given the maximums in the, uh, uh, what was laid down yesterday by Gray Anderson, that was the maximums that we can do. It doesn't mean that's what we have to do. It's just like Kentucky, they didn't do it all. And if, if we could communicate, and that's what I was trying to indicate yesterday um, to one of the speakers was that for two and a half years ago, we pretty much indicated that when we got to this point today, there was gonna be a season, and I'm disappointed that there hasn't been more rhetoric between the, uh, the commission and um, the TOS. But, you know, we have two months now between now and we set the parameters of what the season will be, so I would hope instead of rhetoric that, that may, uh, damage the agency's reputation that these people get with us and, um, and do things to indicate what the agency's done for wildlife watching and, and the things that we've promoted and what we've done for the health of the birds. Um, so I, I hope that, that in the next two months that, that, that we, c we can come up with a, um, a plan that, that they will be comfortable with and that, that, that will also reward our hunters for the the efforts and the license dollars that we've used to actually proliferate this species. Um, we have um, um, two, two, two guidelines that were presented yesterday um, and, and with the maximums that we were given, um, like I say, we don't have to um, abide by that. We, it can be less. I'm not saying that's what we want to do, but I'm just saying whatever we can do to um, appease them and if, if if, if not hunting the birds for a week in, in, in the uh, opinion of our biologists would, would create more of a, a situation that they would still have a good festival, then, you know, then that's what we need to do. Um, I, I, I do hope that, that, we, that we can have that communication. Um, I think yesterday somebody pointed out to me that the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundations, I think Harold told me that they said, without hunters, there is no conservation. And I think that that's, uh, um, a, a good statement and I think that's where this commission stands so I, I hope that there's no I love this agency and I don't want to see bad publicity to um, be derived from trying to um, reward um, our hunting waterfowlers um, with a chance to hunt these magnificent birds but uh, and I think we need to be proactive as commissioners and I think we need to have our thoughts together so when the public does ask us um, why are we hunting them and, and what the situation is, I think they need to understand what we've done to, to, um, to, to help these uh, uh, birds uh, proliferate in our state. So with that, unless anybody else has any comments about that, then we'll move on from that. All right, but this time then I'm gonna ask um, Chairman Schuster to start with our retention and recruitment committee Thank findings you. from yesterday. Thank you, Chairman McMillan. Um, the commission recognizes Mike Butler, CEO of the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, and he's gonna give us a presentation on the Scholastic Clay Target Program. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, sorry that y'all have to listen to me two days in a row, but this should be a, a little different presentation by some significant stretch. Um, typically, you would see Andrew Piercy, raise your hand, given this presentation. But Andrew's still, uh, you know, in coming out of triage, he just finished the state shoot, which was five days long with over 1,400 kids shooting at the Nashville Gun Club. And so I told him that uh, rather than put him in the hospital, that he could kind of kick back and as long as he helped me with updating the numbers. And I also want to introduce Miss Shayla Beebe. Most of you met her before the meeting. She's our new senior program director akin to a chief operating officer and she's managing all of our program staff so if you get a chance to meet with her we're excited about having her on staff <clears throat> let's see slideshow if i can find the, the right buttons here we'll down here that there we go okay some of these things you will have already heard about, so I will keep them quick and we'll try to move quickly through this. Uh, other pieces, I want to take some time and point out some great things we're seeing happen with the program. 
the mission for SCTP is to introduce youth to the shooting sports and recruit them into an outdoor lifestyle for a lifetime. I like to condense that down to a really simple statement. We want to evangelize the outdoors. We're not trying to talk to, we welcome all the kids that want to participate, but we're really specifically focused on those kids that don't have families that hunt or fish, that have never shot a firearm, and that don't know anything about this. And, and that's a large portion of the, the youth that come through this program have never stepped on the line with a firearm to do anything. And, and so the focus is getting as many of these youngsters on the line as possible. It's not about the comp. The competition is a byproduct, and it's a wonderful byproduct, but that's not our focus. This would not be possible without your support. You've supported this program uh, for the last several years. It's been critical support. I can't thank you enough. Uh, you have staff that volunteer their time that are not tasked to help with this, that come and help every year out of the goodness of their heart on their own dime. And uh, you have some of the staff in the state that are coaches, and they do outstanding work. Um, the partnership we have with the agency is absolutely essential, and I'm convinced it's the reason why we have the number one program of this kind in the country. It was founded in 2001, and I've already covered these pieces on the, the different reasons why we do what we do. We do emphasize the scholastic portion. We follow the TSSAA grade point average standard. If they don't make their grades, they don't shoot. And some of the coaches are a little bit more strict than that. Um, I can tell you that we have great anecdotal stories from a lot of different kids where, uh, and I, if I may forward to me an email, we have some essays that kids write for some of our scholarships and they talk about how it really has improved their schoolwork because their coach told them they're not going to shoot unless they make their grades. And so they went and they made their grades. And they were excited and they got to shoot and they won a championship. When we get through this program, the idea is to connect them into hunting opportunities. So starting in 2005, we started doing small series of duck hunts. In 2006 through 8, we did deer, turkey, bear, dove, and quail. Interesting point, we're in the middle of a survey right now of the population of youngsters in the program. 89% of the kids in the program say that if we offer a hunt, they want to go on it. And they don't differentiate very much on what they want to hunt. It's doves, ducks, deer, and turkey. Uh, any one of those four, they'll sign up for it. They love to go. We started in 2009, the Davis P. Rice Memorial Youth Hunts in general. This is where you've heard us talk about and present to you previously about the world's largest youth waterfowl hunt over near Dyersburg, Tennessee. That's been a great event. It is still running very strong. We usually take between 140 to 175 kids uh, out there. Director Carter's been several times and a high proportion of those kids, it's their first hunt of any kind. I'll go back just a little bit. <clears throat> in 2011, we started the Davis P. Rice Dove Hunt in East Tennessee. That is actually expanding in East Tennessee, and we're going to have the first one of its kind in West Tennessee this year. So we'll have an East and West Dove Hunt, and then hopefully add a Middle Tennessee Dove Hunt here pretty soon. Teams. What comprises our teams? 75% of them are affiliated with schools, as you can tell there. The others are self-explanatory. We continue to go towards schools. Many schools treat this as a lettered sport, um, and they, we have a relationship with those schools similar to what TSSAA would have regarding other sports. Team locations, you can see region one and two are big. Region four is the next largest. Region three is the smallest. Uh, I think, I think those, may, those numbers may be backwards actually on the, on the slide point is is that we have more facilities in region one and region two we have fewer facilities in region three and region four um, we are working to try to remedy that um, it's going to take some time while at the same time we need more facilities in region three and four we're out punting our coverage on facilities in region one and and region two just brought a new facility on in Williamson County how many of you are familiar with the Haley Jake with facility if you haven't seen it Commissioner Magley was here yesterday. He spearheaded the development of that. There are three new fields located on the Haley Jakewood WMA, and it's for youth shooting sports. 
and uh, we helped them create a nonprofit organization to help partner with the agency to run that. And uh, it's getting used uh, at an amazing clip. Participation, this is the fun slide. You look at the end here, you look at 2012-13, we just wrapped up the state shoot, nationals come next month, but every single line we have is trending upwards, and especially over the last three years. And I'll attribute that to one thing that we did three years ago that allowed that growth to take place, and it's the addition of Andrew Pearson. He was our first full-time employee that we put on the program. And I can tell you now, we've already outpunted that coverage. Andrew will tell you that he's got 50 million things going on, and it's good. It's good. It's a good problem to have. We've got demand for the program that is uh, really, really putting good types of pressures on us, and we're going to have to be working to figure out how to, how to address that here in the near future. We've got folks calling, wanting to start teams and coaches, wanting to become coaches and trainings and all these fun things. But that's a fairly remarkable trend line. We were at 1,945 kids, I think, this year, somewhere around that neighborhood. Over the last two years, that's net organic growth of 275 kids. I want to point out, every year we lose an entire age class of shooters. The entire senior class graduates. We estimate that to be two to 300 kids a year that we have to replace just to remain flat. We've not only replaced those every year, we've grown it by 275 additional over the last two years. And so it's exciting times. And I think we're about to out, we, we, we're at the, the capacity that, for the state shoot uh, with 1,400. To put that in perspective, there are only two shoots in the United States that are larger than our state shoot. One is the Grand American, I believe, in Sparta, Illinois, and the other one is the national championship for SCTP that's in Illinois. And that national championship has, I think, 1,600 kids in it, and we bring 25% of that population to shoot at the nationals. So it's fairly impressive showing that we put up there. I've already touched on several of these pieces. We have five different, uh, well, th actually four different age classes, rookie, intermediate, senior, and collegiate. They have subdivisions in each one of those. Collegiate is new. Collegiate is growing. Um, I think Tennessee has somewhere between four to five collegiate teams, and that's going to increase here before too long uh, with new facilities coming online near places like UT Martin and other places around the state. There's a breakdown, kind of a, a histogram of, of uh, our grades. You know, where do you see kids coming in? And it's funny. You can take the previous year bar and look at the next year, and you would think it would stay the same, but it doesn't. The previous year age class moves into the next year, plus we're adding to it. And so that, that's a real, that's a real um, encouraging sign for us that, that we're seeing all of those things grow from year to year, even though we're, ma we're maintaining from eighth to ninth, say, from year to year, but we're growing on top of that. We require all of our athletes to pass hunter education. 100%. I think 30 to 40%, that number's ticked up a little bit. 30 to 40% of these kids have never taken hunter education before. Um, several of them have. 80% have new, purchased a new shotgun since joining the program. 60% purchased a license. Uh, for many, this sport is their only extracurricular activity. We attract a lot of kids that aren't going to be your ball players. And we also attract a lot of guys and a lot of gals. And that's, a, that's, that's also a very exciting point. And you're going to see that here in a little bit when we start talking about Olympics. We have over 300 head and assistant coaches that are all volunteer. We train 75 each year, roughly. They have to go through a pretty rigorous training with the NRA level one appointed shotgun training. And then we bring in Olympic level trainers to, to coach our coaches and, and get them up to speed. A lot of this is about making sure they're good coaches. A lot of it's about making sure that we're being smart about safety and that we're taking care of any liabilities. Volunteers, parents, if you ever, how many of y'all have actually been to one of the shoots and seen the spectacle that occurs? So you got a feel for the fact that you get grandmas and you get moms and dads and, and it's, a, it's a fairly wonderful experience to watch. We estimate from our research that each shooter impacts a minimum of five people. And if you're doing that, you're reaching a whole lot of people over the life of the, uh, of the program. 
The registration for the program opens in September. It really starts to pick up after the Davis Rice hunt in January. Um, we try to have a lot of different invitational shoots over the course of the preseason before we go to regionals, which occur in, is it June, Andrew? Right after the morning. Right after we have our regional championships across the state and each of the four regions. Um, we do require, before you go to state shoot, you have to have shot 600 targets. Uh, and I think that's just so that we have kids that are taking this seriously. Now, what's great is the program and the way that we're doing the competition is creating kids that can be immediately successful when they get into the field to go hunt. Not only are they safe, not only have they shot a bunch of rounds, more than I've shot in the last year for sure, when they get into the field, they can hit what they're shooting at, so they're immediately successful. And that is a major, major, major important point because if they're successful, they get excited and they want to come back. And we've seen that happen over and over and over. One of the great things that we've been able to, to do, and we're really proud of this, is Junior Olympics. We've held Junior Olympics and helped run that event, or run that event um, over at Holly Fork on the, on the facility there. Um, We've had great results. We're going to talk a little bit more about Junior Olympics here in a second. But to give you an idea, the Nashville Gun Club, uh, we put a bunker trap there. It just now has been certified as an official U.S. Olympic training center. And so it's going to be attracting new shoots and new training opportunities uh, for Olympic shooters. And I think you're going to see some neat things come of that. I mentioned regionals. I talked about state. Uh, the numbers are fairly staggering when you start looking at how many targets we're throwing. Annual awards, uh, <coughs> you've heard us talk about this in the past. I think the impressive, you know, the impressive things for me are we give away quite a few scholarships. We're approaching $70,000 in scholarships given for, for post-secondary education. The Junior Olympics, two of the 15 current Junior Olympic members are SCTP shooters. Um, the second bullet point here, Hayden Stewart, Hannah Houston. And if I mess this up, Andrew, correct me, please. But Hannah is traveling the world this summer shooting. She was one of our program participants. Depending on what happens with Kim Rohde, she could very well be on the U.S. Olympic team for the next Olympics. I mean, she's that good. And she is, um, is that, you got anything to add to that, Andrew? She is on our junior team. so well they added the previous two events so that she could go to Germany for her first event and have the opportunity to medal as a junior in Peru and Cyprus. So we're very proud of her and her accomplishments. And the junior, what he's saying there as far as junior is different from junior Olympic. That junior Olympic events are different. That's just a junior member of the Olympic mm -hmm. team. Just to give you a little distinction there. I mentioned we go to the national championships. I think we're over, this number needs to be updated, we're over 30 national titles with individuals and, and teams. Um, we give the Jeanette C. Rudy Cup every year to the highest shooter that shoots at the nationals. And uh, the past five years, that cup has gone to the national high overall shooter, the highest overall shooter for the entire meet uh, in Sparta, which is pretty incredible when you consider uh, there's probably 20 plus states in the program. The intangibles, we've touched on those, safety, awareness, responsibility, sportsmanships, relationships. Um, we estimate we've reached over 80,000 people and 85,000 volunteer hours per year in the 12 years that the program's been around. We've thrown around 3 million plus targets a year. I mentioned the graduation loss and replacement. That is something we aggressively try to deal with every year to keep it growing. Our goal internally, our strategic plan for the Federation calls for this program to grow 10% each year over the next three years. So we expect 30% growth in the next three years. When you look at the growth potential, 
we're seeing new teams start up everywhere. We, we can get a person in front of a, a, a group of volunteers or parents or teachers. Uh, Memphis is seeing still expanded growth. We have over 20 teams in Memphis. Memphis. When you start a new team, there's a very specific set of processes that you have to go through to do that. We try to make sure that we, we have that as a very controlled situation. We can't just let anybody start a team, nor do we allow any type of just people to behave the way they want to behave. Every participant and every parent that's involved or adult that's involved in the program has to sign a code of conduct policy, and we do enforce that policy. If they do not follow that policy, we kick them out of the program. Growth, we've added these new ranges or helped add these new ranges. The Carroll County, we assisted with uh, some efforts there along with what was already taking place on the ground. I mentioned Haley Jakewith. And a great story in Moscow, we had a grandfather. We, we, are, we are out of places to practice in Memphis. I mean, we've got kids shooting at Shelby Farms seven days a week, six days a week from most of the day, it's all mapped out. I, think, I don't think I'm exaggerating, am I, Andrew, on that? So he had a grandfather in Moscow, Tennessee, in Fayette County, who said, I want to build a field for my kids to shoot on, this team from Rossville to come shoot on. And we were like, OK, well, how serious are you? And this was on a Friday. He says, the concrete truck's going to be there Tuesday. So what are you all going to do? And so we were able to turn around within, I mean, the fastest field I've ever seen be built. <laughs> they, they got it done in about two weeks. And uh, so we're happy to have that one little field there. And, and a lot of times, that's all it takes to get to get the interest started. Um, now, you know, growth barriers. <clears throat> you've heard me talk about practice capacity. That's a big one. I think you know the other growth barriers we have to be concerned about is, that from our measurements, kids are going to spend on the low end thirty five hundred, on the high end fifty five hundred or more dollars a year to participate in this sport. Now, they do a lot of fundraisers. They do a lot of things to help offset those costs. But they are, when they're in the program, they get committed to it. It's, it's pretty remarkable. We have put a lot of machines around the state on 20 different facilities. The costs have increased significantly, as I mentioned. Uh, we're trying to find all, we're, we're, we're searching under every nook, corner, cranny, crevice to help fi find ways to help the shooters and help us with our capacity challenges as well. We have additional equipment needs that are coming down the pike. Um, there's one that's not listed on here that's a big one, and that's Memphis, our priority. You see Shelby Farms there. That's part of a much larger priority piece that is coming from uh, our board leadership out of Memphis, and that is uh, to put a significant, there is no public facility of any kind down in Memphis. And it's the largest population center in the state, or at least equal to Nashville. So there's a great need there. This Shelby Farms indicates, and that's that's just our part of it. I think all in, we're going to probably be around 35,000. But that's going to add an additional field to the two we have at Shelby Farms. That is a short-term solution to buy us time for the bigger-term challenge that we've got to face down there. Um, we'll have three fields at Shelby Farms once we get that, that field in. And then Greenville, Knoxville, those are all being driven by local volunteers, and we'll wait and see what happens there. Um, so in conclusion, that's the state of the program as it sits now. It's uh, exciting. It's challenging. Uh, we have a great opportunity to grow the program uh, significantly over the next three years. We have at least the basic staff we have need in place, but we're gonna we're gonna be probably talking about where we can find help to continue to grow it because we've got people knocking on our door on a daily basis, and like I said, those are all great problems to have. But uh, again, reiterate, without your support, we wouldn't be having these conversations. So, any questions? Mike, would you uh, talk a little bit about what? You how the money's allocated to new teams and how that process works from getting a team started. When we have a team come in, and I'm going to rely on Andrew on some of this, we give first year new teams, we give um, ammunition. And how much ammunition do we provide them? Two flats? 
per shooter. So we give them two cases of shells per shooter for every new team in the first year. And then I seem to recall that there was a commissioner about seven years ago that, that really encouraged us to make sure that, that the teams and, the, and, the, and participants got used to paying their way on the program. And I think his name was Bill Cox. And so we really listened to that commissioner at that time and, and started making sure that after that first year that they started picking up that, that cost and carrying that cost. So what we, we used to do a little bit more than that, but to the wisdom of this commissioner at that time, he was right. You know, once we, we give that first year to get them started, to get them helped out, to get them up and running, and then subsequent years, they don't apply. If they don't get those grants, they can go after NRA grants, and they can go other places to get assistance. Most of these teams are raising money locally to help offset their costs. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I suppose you're still doing like that. So most of the money that you're getting now, most all of it, you're going to physical facility program? Um, not exactly. We have a budget of around four hundred and thirty to four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and so we a, a lot of the money that we are. I mean, it, it's it's broken up across the range. I mean, we do spend a significant amount on facilities improvement, but we have to maintain and operate the program, and that's not cheap. Um, just to just to keep it running on a day to day basis. Forget give you an example. We'll spend. The state shoot is probably what 50, 55,000, yes. somewhere in that neighborhood, just to hold the state shoots, fifty-five thousand um, dollars. Of course, we we try to the participants cover the cost of that, but that means that it's it's not inexpensive to participate in it. The the original reason that the TWRA got involved in this was to was obviously to get kids involved, but in hopes of of building sportsmen to build that would buy licenses only 60 percent are buying licenses what i guess i'll ask the agency this what are what's the agency doing maybe the state shoot or some of these other shoots to take advantage of this concentration of of people to sell licenses are we and i'll address that to whoever wants to take it but i went to the state shoot a few years ago and 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 director myers was cooking hamburgers and doing things. We had a tent set up and I went back and we didn't have a presence there. So I don't know whether we did anything this year or not, but I just wonder, brought to mind, what are we, are we, we have a booth, are we selling licenses? Are we talking to grandparents and parents and doing those kind of things or? Director. Four thousand people out there. We might set up something and try to have a little higher presence than we do. That's my suggestion. I 
police officer side, I've got the, at the public shoot, at the state shoot recently, and even when I wasn't there, Commissioner Rice was the first name. <laughs> I would add, I would add, Commissioner Cox, that um, you know, in the early days of the program, the agency tasked staff to help with the thing, and 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 working with uh, former assistant director uh, Ron Fox, we we sat down and they were showing us that the costs were just too much, and so we've successfully transitioned out of having to use any, I guess, assigned staff. To help run any of these events and that's been a healthy thing for us and I think it's been a healthy thing for the agency I think that there's uh, the agency has a strong presence at the Davis P rice hunts um, ha and have since the beginning um, I think there's some probably some simple things that we can get together with on on uh, maybe improving visibility and promotion but I will say um, I wanted to thank director Carter publicly we shooting USA Jim Scouton's program came to the state shoot this year um, and we were able to get an interview uh, for the director on that program so when that comes out we'll email that out to y'all so that you can watch that program and and see you know the there they interviewed myself they interviewed him and then they followed a bunch of kids around for two days and so that should be some some good public relations work there for the agency and, and the federation as well I, I attended the uh, the Davis Rice uh, youth hunt last year and um, it was interesting to me that the criteria that uh, Jerry Strom of course it's agency personnel made to bring those kids in all of them had, could have never uh, this was their first hunt ever so he gets them from the from the Scholastic Clay program and this year I believe it's gonna be 50 in it 50 kids and so to find 50 kids that have never hunted and obviously they've been through the shooting program and then they will buy a license then to have to, to to hunt so hopefully that'll and and they were good shots um so and they and they had good um uh, uh, safety techniques and also i was pretty impressed and to have 50 kids that have never been hunting the parents were with them and it, and well, it was 25 last year it's gonna be 50 this year but uh it's pretty impressive to see that many kids get to, uh, to be part of their first hunt it's a neat experience I, I failed to mention one thing if I can add this last piece um, one of the things that we have been challenged by one of our donors to do is to uh, invest significantly in developing uh, kind of first-class metrics to measure the impacts of our programs all of our programs at the Federation on the youth that we're engaging that includes our great outdoors university program and hunters for the hungry um, that that is being funded by a separate pot of money and it's a uh, it's going to be a significant effort starting next year and uh, one of the interim steps in that process is that responsive management mr. Duda who was here yesterday has been leading a national recruitment and retention evaluation program that has been funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the Turkey Federation the first phase of that is a binder about that thick of results where they evaluated the recruitment retention programs of state wildlife agencies from across the country the second piece that they're in the middle of doing is evaluating recruitment retention programs from NGOs around the country they we asked they offered and at no cost to us they have agreed to come in and add our great outdoors university program and SCTP as part of that evaluation and so we'll be getting those results here probably within the next year and that is a stair step into our next phase which is going to be developing uh, these first class metrics and measurements methodologies the three M's as we like to say to go out and we're not talking about measuring outputs I can show you graphs of outputs all day we're talking about measuring outcomes we're talking about how do we change lives with these programs because we we see it happening in front of our eyes but being able to communicate it is very difficult and so what we're going to work is to perfect methodologies to be able to relay to you guys who are the funders and we've been asked this by other foundations to do the same type of work and in actuality uh, we're going to be leading that effort here in middle tennessee and when we get those methodologies nailed down we're going to share that with other ngos in the state and so that's going to be a follow-up piece um, 
to this that is very important and I failed to mention in my presentation. So that um, that's when I think we'll get to see some really exciting stuff rather than just graphs and numbers, which are good too. Mr. Butler, what's your plan as far as um, engaging uh, in East Tennessee and moving forward and to be more active in that area, in that region? We need to add a field director that can get around the state at all times because what's happened is that the daily maintenance uh, of the program, just running what we currently have is uh, a one man, more than a one man job. And, and, and from our focus, we don't know exactly how we're gonna shake that out, but we need a person that can get, be out in the field all the time. Right now, we rely on volunteers to do that, and we're having some success, but we know from experience in other programs that we've run that if we have that person out there selling the program, it's gonna grow at a, an amazing rate. I, I, I agree, too. I think you might be missing some opportunities up in East Tennessee with some local school systems there. So. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Mike, along the lines of what Commissioner Cox was asking you, and, and I'm not sure how this works, is there a dove hunt that these participants can go to in each of the regions? Where are these dove hunts that, uh, like Commissioner McMillan attended or Chairman McMillan? Well, the agency holds dove hunts that, that kids can attend just as part of the dove hunt program the agency has, but these are specific just to kids. And, and I'm wondering, can, is that something that could be done in each of the regions mm -hmm. and would it be helpful? Absolutely, and we're looking into that. That's why, with the help of Tom Rice, um, who has uh, been, you know, the his late son is the namesake of these shoots, these hunts. Um, we've been uh, looking at opportunities to expand those, and we have some volunteers. Our challenge is capacity. Our challenge is the capacity to be able to do it. It, it takes people to execute it, and we've got some great volunteers, uh, but we need that director presence to get out there and, and work with folks to do that. And I think um, the West Tennessee hunt will be similar to the East Tennessee hunt and I think they've expanded the field for the East Tennessee hunt this year so they can accommodate those 50 kids and uh, I to be honest Commissioner I think next year if we don't have a Middle Tennessee hunt shame on us it's just a matter of effort anyone else Director Carter, I think the, the real question that Commissioner Cox was asking is just whether you can cook hamburgers and hot dogs at the event. So you might want to get with him on that. So anyway, Mike, thank you very much. Um, the success of the program is amazing. I know that uh, Miss Rudy, uh, if she were still alive, would be really proud of the success of the, the program and just getting all these kids involved. So thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. I guess we'll take a quick short break here. Thank you.